dobbiamo andare avanti perché il tempo è davvero tiranno. We have to get going. Time is flying. And now we should once again restrict our investigation and we should focus on to the Jewish investigation of the scripture. And here we find a constant worry in the actualization of the biblical text, which is once again seen in the Midrashim. The Midrash is a literary genre which is very much uh, utilized in the rabbinic literature. And the story of Joseph finds in the Midrashim a very broad echo. Now, this topic is going to be dealt with by Mauro Berani from the University of Bologna. And uh, Professor Perani graduated in philosophy and also in Oriental history. Uh, and the thesis was on the presence of Jew the Jews in Sardinia. In 2013, he received uh, the honoris causa degree from uh, the Jerusalem uh, University because of his uh, findings in the field of the Jewish uh, manuscripts, his own uh, bibliography which is uh, accessible on many different uh, sites, is uh, a list of articles and studies. Now let's uh, pass the floor to Professor Perani with any further ado. It is uh, 45 minutes past uh, four. He, and at about uh, five, 10 past five, I would like him to draw the conclusions so as to leave more room for possible questions, possibly more than one. And here again, I would like to apologize for a presentation which is not uh, stressing enough uh, the incredible value of this incredible speaker. But again, let me thank him for his being with us today, for having uh, accepted our invitation. And let me once again say that it's a great honor of having him with us today. Professor Perani, please take the floor. Many thanks. Yes, I will uh, try and stay within the time limits that were assigned. And uh, let's get going. In uh, the document uh, known as the Interpretation of the Bible in the Church, published on April 15th, 1993, by the Pontifical Biblical Commission, when talking uh, and dealing with the inter Jewish interpretation of the scriptures, Mention is made and appreciation is given of the constant worry towards the actualization of the biblical text and how that was seen in the Targumim, that is uh, ancient uh, tra 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 translations or paraphrases, uh, the ancient Aramaic uh, translations or paraphrases, and also in the Midrashim, that is the interpretation that find in the biblical text some further meanings that are not immediately apparent. Uh, we know that the Midrash is a literary genre of the rabbinic uh, literature, very much utilized, and that the term comes from the Darash Jewish root, which means uh, investigating and studying as well, especially if we do think that for the Jews, the school is known as Beta Midrash. Now, as a literary genre with reference to its content, uh, we have a partition in uh, the Halakhic Midrash, especially if the investigation is having to do with norms and precepts, uh, and the Haggadic one, if it is uh, of a narrative, exhortative and parenthetic nature. Now, for those who approach uh, for the first time to the Midrashic exegesis, uh, many methods and interpretative uh, procedures uh, may seem rather fanciful, very much subjective, ridicule or sometimes arbitrary, but it is not so. And uh, that's why the Midrash was defined. The Midrash has rightly been called a theology in the form of a legend. So let me say something about the very rich, almost infinite. I think that a book, two books could be written as to what the Midrash is saying about the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph finds an incredible echo in the Midrashim, 
maybe because this is uh, an event that was characterized by incredible substantial elements uh, that are particularly appropriate for the reflection and uh, uh, valorization uh, that are which is so suited to typical midrashic reflection and valorization the adventurous aspects of the event uh, and of the story which is dominated by unforeseen events uh, and by the reversal of the situation laden with suspense and with an incredible reversal of uh, fates uh, showing uh, how God is leading and conducting the events of history. Well, all of these elements are particularly suited to the paranetic uh, and edifying reinterpretation. That is to say, the one that the Midrash Agada sets out to achieve. Uh, Joseph, because of the Midrashic interpretation, was the favorite of his father. Jacob. Uh, Jacob saw in him uh, the reflection of his own physiognomy, as well as the beauty of his wife, Rachel. And Jacob, uh, in addition, had taught Joseph all the rules of conduct, the halakot, that he himself had learned from Shem and Eber. Joseph was as handsome as his mother, Rachel. He was charming to the point of becoming the type of um, seducer and a formidable, as well as unintentional heartbreaker, especially for Egyptian women. His father had given him a multicolored uh, tunic, Genesis 37.3, and in Hebrew Passim, it's uh, a name which is a plural name, it's a noun, which is variously explained by the rabbis who see in it all of the misfortunes that will happen to him and that are foreshadows in each one of the consonant letters that uh, make up the word pasim, that is P-S-Y-M. P hints at Potiphar, Far the pharaoh, his master. S hints to Soharim, the merchants who bought him. Y, that is Yod, to the Ishmaelites, to whom his brothers had sold him. M stands for Mem, the Midianites, who sold him to Potiphar. And you can see how fanciful, because out of a word, you can then uh, infer something else. Now, in this biblical narration, Joseph was, as a matter of fact, sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites, who led him and took him to Egypt, uh, and then sold him to the Madianites, who then sold him again, in turn, to Potiphar, the counselor of the Pharaoh and the commander of the guards. Now, ever since his own adolescence, uh, Joseph has been described as a wise, smart, intelligent, but very much handsome and vain young man. This is how the Midrash describes him, Bereshit Rabbah, that is a Midrash that was composed and written in between the end of the 4th and the beginning of the 5th century. And here I quote, Joseph was 17 years old and he was a boy, Genesis 37, 2. And he did boyish things. He would touch his eyes, he would walk on his heels, and he would fix his hair. End of quotation. Amongst the sons of Jacob, Joseph, more than all of the others, resembled his father, his favorite he was. And he also resembled his father because of another thing, according to the Midrash. That is, uh, both Jacob and his son Joseph were already born circumcised. And both of them then became shepherds. I believe that this is very interesting. The fact that they were born already circumcised, which is almost recalling the virgin birth of virgin of the Virgin Mary without the original sin, and uh, it is a very special connotation for both of them. The theme of uh, wisdom and uh, 
culture is reiterated by Targo Mirzalmi in Genesis 37 2, when it is said that Joseph had acquired all the wisdom of his father and was the teacher of his own brothers of whom he was referring uh, and reporting the incredible nasty things uh, and uh, besides speaking ill of them to their father this is why they hated him and felt hatred and resentment or envy for him and when the biblical text to Genesis 39 1 says that Joseph was uh, taken down to Egypt uh, the Tankuma Midrash that was written in between the 8th and the 9th century is inviting us to read with a simple shift in the vowel of the consonant text not the passive kurad form which would then be exactly meaning uh, he was taken down, but uh, the causative active form known as Horid, whereby he was made go down because he was uh, the one who made his father and his brother go to Egypt. And here, let me read this uh, Midrash uh, text. So there was uh, a cow upon which the yoke was imposed, but the cow refused it. So what did they do to the cow? They took away its calf and brought him to where it was supposed to, the cow was supposed to plow. The calf began to complain and the cow, when hearing this, went in spite of herself to the place because of her son. So the Holy One, blessed be he, wanted to fulfill the prophecy announced by Abraham with the words, you must know for certain that your descendants and your offspring will be, Genesis 15, 13, and to fulfill it, he found as an occasion the sale of Joseph. And after that, all of the others came to Egypt. In some of the Midrashic texts, so when Joseph uh, reaches Egypt with the Ishmaelites that had bought him, both Potiphar, counselor of the Pharaoh and commander of the guards, but even more so his wife Zuleika, having seen his incredible charm and his incredible beauty and great culture, wanted to absolutely buy him so as to have him with them. But as a matter of fact, for the Midrash, there was a strong passion, attraction, and sexual desire towards Joseph. And this was happening in both Potiphar and as well as in his wife Zuleika. The first one, a priest of Ilotolatra's cults, uh, who was lusting after the handsome young man to satisfy his lust. And uh, for this reason, the angel Gabriel punished him with the mutilation of his genitals to prevent him from realizing his uh, incredible lust for Joseph. The second one, that is his wife Zuleika, having seen him, fell madly in love with him with an incontrollable longing and passion to be united with, with him. So to make sure that she would buy him, she would send one of her eunuchs inviting him to do everything possible to bring Joseph to her house. It is truly incredible how the Midrash is uh, leading the situation to the extreme of the, to the highest peak of conflict, thus extremizing the fatal attraction towards Joseph of both spouses, both Potiphar and Zalika. And uh, Di Giuseppe, together with the Midrash text, are, are highlighting the incredible wisdom, uh, the Bedha Midrash, uh, the ability to interpret uh, dreams, and most of all, that the Lord was with him and brought him success in whatever he did. And as Genesis 39.3 goes, the Lord was with him and brought him success in whatever he did. So, for example, at the court of the Pharaoh, he was uh, pouring aromatic wine, but if then the Pharaoh would uh, rather wish it, wish it to be warm and bitter, the wine would then uh, uh, please the taste and uh, desire of the Pharaoh. But uh, the Midrash wanted to teach us a lesson whereby too much uh, 
fortune may uh, make us make may make man become haughty so it explains that the attempt of seduction by the wife of Potiphar as a test, a test that was sent by God. So this is the interpretation of the Midrash Tanhuma, which is mentioned above, which is commenting on the Joseph success at the Pharaoh's court. When Joseph uh, saw that he was uh, so highly considered, he started to drink, uh, eat, uh, touching his hair and went saying, blessed be the Lord who made me forget the family of my father. That is when uh, the holy uh, blessed he be. How can you say that your, your father is uh, wearing uh, the cloth and you can only drink and eat and touch your hair? You, parasite, I will send you a bear. And as a matter of fact, uh, in Genesis 39, 7, 7, we see that the wife of the master looked and raised his eyes and looked at Joseph. And here we could see the comparison. A strong man, a robust man was in the public square, uh, setting his hair, touching his hair, and walking and saying, I'm strong, I'm smart and uh, good looking. And so then they told him, here is a bear for you. If you are of any value, kill it. So this is uh, with reference to the wife of Potiphar. The entire resistance of Joseph uh, resisting uh, the lures of uh, Zuleika. And the name is a name that comes uh, or that appears only in the Sefer Aryar Shah, that is the name of Zuleika. And this can be found or traced back to the centuries going from the 11th to the 12th. And uh, nonetheless, uh, Zuleika, the wife of Potiphar, as we shall then see, finds incredible space and many uh, variations as well as to the Midrashim theme. Now, this is because in the Midrashim uh, we see the justice and the strength of uh, Joseph, uh, who thus becomes uh, the type of man who can uh, control his uh, sexual drive and instincts. Zuleika then does all she can to try and control the desire to lie with this man. And each pretext is good. Uh, she calls on the astrologers uh, uh, who had revealed to her that uh, she will have some offspring from Joseph, but that of the offspring will only be coming out of the um, young Joseph marrying uh, her daughter, Asenat. And, uh, she is promising her own self, her own body. The Pharaoh and the Egyptians will abandon the idolatry so as to serve the God of Israel. She dresses in a provocative way. She wears perfume, but then everything is unseen. There is a dialogue. I would like to read it to you very quickly in this text in uh, the book of the sage and righteous uh, where Zuleika says, and this is a question and an answer, Zuleika says, how handsome you are, you fascinate me because one has never seen a slave with a talent like yours, Joseph. The Lord who formed me in my mother's womb created all human beings, Zuleika. How beautiful are your eyes, with which you fascinated all Egyptians, both men and women, and Joseph. As beautiful as they may be, while I am alive, they will be just as horrible when they are in the tomb. Zuleika, how lovely and pleasant are your words. Please, take your harp, play and sing, so that I may hear your words. Joseph, my words are lovely and pleasant when I proclaim the praises of my God. Zuleika, how long 
and beautiful your hair is. Take my golden comb and comb it. And Joseph, how long are you going to keep talking to me like this? Go away. You'd better take care of your husband, Suleika. In her reply, she says, there is nothing in my house that I like except for you. The wife of the pharaoh is uh, shocked and falls ill because of this passion. All of the Egyptian women go and comfort her. And what we see is that Joseph is as uh, stable as a uh, stone and uh, she is resisting the extreme attempt of her seduction. But the Benesid Rabah then goes a step forward and turns this episode in a, an even more dramatic one, stressing that uh, the overcoming of temptation is uh, the result of divine help. This text, as a matter of fact, is presenting Joseph uh, in bed with Zuleika, but uh, because of a miraculous intervention of God, he then becomes uh, impotent, he has a vision of his father and then flees uh, from this uh, woman who will uh, run after him and take part of her robe and then accuses him that she, he is the one who wanted to lie down with her and that uh, she could only uh, tear part of his robe when he was uh, running away. So one day when Joseph came into the house to do his work, uh, there was no servant in the house, Genesis 39, 11. There was no man there. Joseph looked at himself and didn't find himself or didn't see himself as a man because uh, Rabbi Shemuel says that his uh, sex had stretched and then relaxed. Rabbi Ishak says, his seed dispersed and uh, flew out of uh, through his nails uh, and the Rabbi Huna and the Rabbi Matan he said that he saw the image of his father and that his blood ran cold who did this the God of your father who helps you that is the God Almighty in other words Hadn't it happened to that the image of his father appeared before his eyes and blocked him? And as you've seen, according to the narration, the way the story goes, but uh, I see that the time is flying, so I will try and go towards my conclusions. There are other themes that have been uh, developed in the Midrash, such as the interpretation of the dream of the Pharaoh, etc., etc. For example, his sagacity of uh, shrewd politician and his stratagems during the famine to get to know his brothers, uh, and in particular, his pathetic and poignant encounter with them, whereby there is a uh, the episode when he reaches uh, out to them and embrace them and when uh, he says i am your brother joseph it was as if their spirit that is the brother's spirit had detached itself and they were struck dumb then by a miracle of the lord the spirit returned to them so here said joseph your eyes and the one of uh, Benjamin can see that it is I, Joseph, who am speaking to you. I am speaking to you in the sacred language, but they wouldn't believe him. But when they then recognized him, they came forward to kill him. But then an angel scattered them to the four corners of the house. 
And at this point, uh, the Yehuda cried out with such a voice that the walls of Egypt collapsed. All pregnant women were miscarried. miscarried. Joseph and the Pharaoh fell from their seats. And all of the most powerful men who stood before Joseph saw their faces turned away and their teeth fall out. When Joseph saw that the brothers were full of shame, he then said to them, come closer to me. And they did go closer. And then each one of them kissed him and started crying. In this way, the Midrashta wishes to emphasize to the highest level that nothing can oppose the fulfillment of the divine plan, which in fact almost plays at turning upside down the situations and uh, makes fun of men who would like things to be different. The sapiential teaching is that God knows how to draw good from evil and that he makes everything contribute to the good of the one who loves him and whom he will he has chosen to carry out his plan of salvation. Thank you, um, Dr. Rani, thank you for this uh, deep-reaching analysis of the Midrashim. We have about 10 minutes to start um, a brief discussion. If, um, as in the previous case, we can have uh, brief, uh, clear questions, perhaps we can get two in. So I think that this um, presentation has um, uh, whetted your appetite for discussion and uh, the quickest will get the floor. I think everybody's um, been uh, petrified by Midrash. I think Demario's asked for the floor. Yes, go ahead. But I can't hear anything. No, no, I've got to turn my microphone on. Thank you, Professor. You gave us uh, an account, uh, which is uh, very topical uh, with regard to the risk. Um, Joseph uh, ran. I think uh, really reminds us of the uh, experience of um, quite a lot of politicians who have to be very careful. So thank you, uh, Professor Perani, for this uh, insight into the Midrash. I just wanted to say that uh, in all this, um, in all these events, I am struck by how relevant the text is. Uh, Thomas Mann's book about Joseph and his uh, uh, books, Joseph and his brothers, which is not just very faithful to the text of Philo and most of the Midrashim, which uh, the professor referred to, apart from one point with, uh, with regard to uh, Potiphar and uh, his wife. When Potiphar's uh, wife uh, accuses, Mr. Shifley uh, accuses Joseph and uh, claims that uh, uh, she uh, grasped his uh, cloak. Philo says the husband convinced that this was the truth ordered to put the man in prison and thus committed to 
serious uh, mistakes because he contempt him without judgment and uh, without giving him the possibility to defend himself and secondly because what the wife said saying it um, was a um, was in, because if it, he had uh, been violent to her, he could have uh, kept his um, uh, clothes. Uh, but um, it was obvious that uh, if his uh, clothing had been taken from him, he was uh, not the author of the action. This is the only point where Thomas Mann's uh, narrative diverges from uh, Philos, because Thomas Mann, uh, in a way, uh, defends Potifa and uh, suggests that in his judgment, he takes into account everything, probably for the reason which uh, was mentioned, the fact that he himself was attracted to uh, the young Joseph, but also because there's an element of wisdom in uh, Potifa, which is um, very interesting and which will return uh, in a large part of uh, Thomas Mann's um, whereas, for example, Joseph and the fig tree, where Joseph speaks of the specificity of the tree, which is not male or female, but both, and this is uh, very consoling to Potifa. In his, in his condition of great eunuch. Uh, this is something which um, struck me because it seems that Thomas Mann interprets, uh, attributes the figure and the role of a statesman to Potifar. So that, that's also a question to you, Professor. The fact is that uh, I've uh, just given uh, 10,000 of what you could find in the Midrashim, because there's endless uh, content. Uh, there are many things and the opposite of many things. So there can be lots of interpretations which uh, might seem to conflict with each other. But this is part of the uh, richness of the Midrashic uh, text, which, well, and also the uh, Midrash starts from the concept um, the rabbinic context. In the Torah, there's no before or after. Uh, everything is uh, contemporaneous, so that you can see a scene in the Midrash where Moses speaks with Potiphar. Uh, they meet and they have a talk because there's no uh, before or after in the Torah, but everything is uh, as in a state of absolute presence. So the uh, individuals of four or five uh, centuries earlier can meet uh, people from uh, centuries later. In any case, to invent certain uh, midrashim, uh, there's quite a lot of um, ability required because one midrash says what is different from between Yadish and Isha. Ish doesn't have a final A, and Isha. Uh, doesn't have the I. If you take out from Ish and Sha the I and the A, uh, you get Ya. So if you take Ya out from the union of man and woman, that union 
will be broken. But if you found on Ya the Y man and the A the woman has, it's, it's nice. But uh, let's move on because uh, time is short. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, final uh, comments. I think these words themselves uh, show us that what you said about the Midrashim are just uh, one out of a thousand uh, that could be said. It's a very, very uh, a drop in an ocean. And uh, uh, with the um, input of Mari Guaraldi, you've given us something uh, extra. So it's 5.20 p.m. now. We will now have 10 minutes break. You'll have the um, possibility of um, relaxing a moment, uh, your eyes and your minds, and we'll be restarting uh, punctually at 5.30 p.m. for the second part of this session. Thank you again to all of you.